vision that you can all see this eye and you can all read the text you can process this visual information you all can see we often take our vision for granted I don't know if you all ever think of how are we actually seeing what are our eyes and our brain how is it processing all of this information well this evening they're going to be explaining to us how the visual system works they're also going to be going over some modern medicine and I think some ideas for the future. Our first speaker is Dr. Van Gelder. He is going to give the background on how the eyes work and he's going to go over quite a few really basic common medical disorders. I want to describe his academic pilgrimage because he's crossed a lot of country and visited another Washington during his academic journey. He started out at Stanford where he obtained his medical degree and also his doctorate degree in the neurosciences. He then moved to Washington University, which is in St. Louis. There he rose up the academic ranks to, the, to have a professorship in the Department of Ophthalmology and Visual Sciences. We were lucky enough to recruit him here a year ago where he accepted the position as the Boyd Busey Professor and Chairman of the Department of Ophthalmology here. Since moving here, he's established a clinical practice both at Harborview Medical Center and also at the UW at our eye center. Over his academic career, he's received numerous teaching awards and also he's been listed in Best Doctors in America for the past three or four years. For his scientific work, he is very active in our neurobiology and behavior graduate program. I'm told that his research focuses on two areas, and I'm hoping that he'll go into them a little bit in his presentation. The first has to do with non-visual photoreception. Basically, how can the eye sense light without seeing? And the second gets into issues of photoreceptive cells and the retina, which he's going to explain what these are. But basically, he wants to try and restore some sort of vision-like function in certain forms of blindness. For his scholarly work, he's had numerous peer-reviewed publications in such highly regarded journals as Science. And in fact, one of his publications, he garnered the very prestigious position of having one of his images on the cover. He's an editorial board member of numerous journals. He's the author of a textbook, which is a review of uveitis. And he actually has patents from his early work when he was at Stanford. Um, there he developed a technique where they amplified RNA and it's commonly used to generate probes for microarray screening. Now this shows a picture of Dr. Van Gelder with his wife and two children. They went a few years ago to Washington Pass and you can see this in the background. It was a beautiful sunny day and I think at that point he realized he had to move west to Washington State and the University of Washington to move west from Washington University. So I am really looking forward to learning about the eye and just sitting back and thinking about how we actually see and how you can tell the color of my jacket. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Van Gelder. Well, thank you so much for that very, very kind introduction. Um, in the next 45 minutes or so, I want to take you on a little bit of a whirlwind tour through the visual system and why people go blind and what we're doing about it. Now, to start, I want to uh, give some background in, in ophthalmology. Uh, there's always a little bit of confusion. What's an ophthalmologist? What's an optometrist, an optician? An ophthalmologist is a medical doctor, usually an MD or sometimes a DO, who's been through medical school residency 
uh, and then usually internship, residency, and often subspecialty training. And we are the surgeons uh, and medical doctors of eye disease. Uh, optometrists go through their own training, which is optometry school, and in most states, uh, including Washington, don't have a scope of practice that includes uh, surgical uh, treatment of the eyes. Now, if you're going to see one surgeon in your life, the odds are it's going to be me or, or one of my colleagues. Can I take a, a straw poll here? How many people in the room have seen an ophthalmologist at some point in their life? Yeah. <clears throat> and I think if I asked the similar question, how many had seen an ear, nose, and throat doctor or a urologist or, or uh, uh, other specialty surgeons, the numbers would be much lower. And the reason is that almost everyone has problems at some point in their life with their eyes, and very often those are surgical problems. And I want to talk a little bit uh, this evening about what those problems are and, and how we treat them. Now to start, we should do a little bit of anatomy of the eye. What I always tell my patients is that the eye is like a camera, and that's the easy way to think about it. Light comes in this side, if you can see the pointer, uh, and is refracted or focused by two elements, the cornea, the clear part that you see, and the lens, which we'll talk about in a moment. This causes the image to be formed on the retina, the back surface of the eye, which acts very much like the film in an old camera, or those of you who are under 20, the digital sensor uh, in the back of the camera. Um, it is actually more like a digital sensor in that the signals are uh, converted from light into electrical impulses from certain nerves in the retina, and those are transmitted out the optic nerve, which has about a million, 1.2 million little axons in it, to the brain, and that's how we see. The retina really is the workhorse of the eye. That is the, the magical tissue that can convert light energy into chemical en energy and into electrical energy. And it's actually built backwards from the way you or I would probably build it. Light actually comes in through the bottom here in this image and has to transmit all the way through to the very back surface of the retina, which is where the photoreceptors, the rods and cones are. The rods and cones contain a molecule called rhodopsin or conopsin. And this molecule has the unique property of being able to be, uh, the retinaldehyde in it can be isomerized by light. That is, it can be switched back and forth between two configurations. And the protein surrounding that molecule, called opsin, can read which configuration it's in and then signal that to the rest of the cell. This cell then communicates chemically with the next cell down, which is called a bipolar cell. And that cell then communicates and converges on a smaller number of ganglion cells who are the neurons that actually communicate from the eye out to the brain. As we'll talk about, many of the forms of blindness that are most common in this country now affect various parts of the retina, so it's important to have a working knowledge of this as we go forward. Now, in many med school, I don't know if they've talked to you yet about vital signs, but when a patient goes down, the, the first thing you want to do is see if they're breathing, what their blood pressure is, what their heart rate is, and maybe you care about what their temperature is. In ophthalmology, those are not really our vital signs. We'll check them when we need to, but, but usually most patients, we don't worry too much about how fast they're breathing or what their heart rate is. We worry about how well they see. And so our vital signs are what is the visual acuity. And over the last 100 years, there have been a wonderful set of tools developed to measure acuity. This is an example of the eye chart everyone's familiar with. This is like the Snellen acuity, where each letter is precisely formed to take up exactly the same space on the retina. And each little part of the letter, like the, the uh, small part of the F here, uh, take up exactly one second of uh, arc within the, the retina. And by seeing how far people can read down this chart, that gives us a very good idea of how, how well their visual system is working. The other vital sign that we look at is pupillary response. Sometimes people have a hard time reading the chart, or they don't want to read the chart, or there are reasons why their, their reading of the chart may not be uh, accurate, but it's hard to fake a pupil exam. And so if you look at how the pupils respond to light and darkness, that gives you a very good idea of whether the optic nerve is uh, working and whether it's communicating appropriately with the brain. When you have a complete eye exam, we also look at the ocular motility, how the eyes are moving together, what the pressure is inside the eye, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, we do an examination with a special microscope called a slit lamp that lets us see the fine details of the front of the eye. And then in a complete examination, the ophthalmologist will put those eye drops in that dilate the pupil. And that's so we can get a good look at the retina. The back of the eye, it's very dark in there, and it's very hard to see through a small pupil. When we dilate the uh, pupils, that gives us an opportunity to really see the retina in all its glory. Okay, so on to the meat of the talk. Why do people go blind? Why does the eye fail us, uh, and what do we do about it? We'll talk about the leading four reasons uh, today of why people go blind in this country. 
The most common form uh, in 1900 of blindness would be this, which is a cataract, which we'll talk about first. Then we'll talk about macular degeneration, glaucoma, and finally diabetic retinopathy. Now these diseases are, are all very prevalent in this country and becoming more so. And that's because they are highly age related. Now I don't know that anyone's vision is good enough to see this very clearly, but this, these are the age adjusted incidence curves for cataract. And so an age adjusted incidence means how many people, actually this is an age adjusted prevalence curve, how many people have the disease at any given point in time. And if you look at these curves, and we have one for uh, men here and one for women, and they're about the same. Uh, at age 50 or so, very, very few people have a, a visually significant cataract, less than 1% of the population. And by the time we get to age 80, that number goes up to about 70%. So if you are sitting there and look to your left and look to your right, by the time all three of you are uh, 80, two of you will have had cataracts uh, that are significant enough to warrant surgery. Very, very common condition, almost unavoidable. Macular degeneration, which is the leading cause of blindness currently in this country, is also age-related. The numbers are not quite as high, but they're substantial. And so if you look at those curves, by age 85, about 15% of Americans will have significant signs of macular degeneration. This is a very high number. And about 30% of individuals over 80 will have some signs of age changes that are harbingers or, or predictors of macular degeneration. Now, I don't worry that the economic downturn is going to put me out of business. Uh, demand for ophthalmologic services is tremendous and becoming more so. Why? Because the population is aging. And if we look at the demographic curves in this country, you'll see an inflection point here in the number of individuals 65 or over that occurs right around now, 2010. And that, of course, is the baby boom hitting its Medicare years. That is, the individuals born in 1945 this year or next year will hit 65 and begin uh, uh, the Medicare phase of, of their, their lives. And if you look at these curves, you'll see between now and 2050, there will be an approximate doubling of the number of individuals 65 and over, and an approximate doubling of the number of individuals who are age 80 or over. So if you crunch the numbers and put this all together, which the National Eye Institute has done, and look at the numbers of individuals in this country who are at risk for eye disease, you'll see that uh, for cataract, for example, it's about 20 million uh, in 2002. That's going to go to about 30 million by 2020. Similarly, for diabetic retinopathy, glaucoma, and macular degeneration, about 50% more people in this country will have significant eye disease in the year 2020 than did in the year 2002. So we have a great deal to do as ophthalmologists, and we still, as you'll see from this talk, have a great deal uh, to learn and to improve in our clinical practice to prevent all of these people from losing vision as they grow older. So let's start with cataract, because this is the most common uh, cause of vision loss. Uh, worldwide, it is still the most common cause of blindness. In this country, it is no longer the most common cause of blindness, or even in the top five, and that's because it's very effectively treated surgically. The symptoms of cataract are generally blurred vision, glare, difficulty driving at night in, in oncoming headlights, loss of contrast, colors turning muted or yellow. Symptoms are, are of course, what the patient complains of. Signs are what the, the physician or others see uh, when they examine the patient. And the sign for us with a cataract is the, the lens, that inside part of the eye, becomes opaque. It's as if someone took a piece of scotch tape and put it over the, the lens of the camera. And here you can see with the slit lamp examination, this is the reflection, the diffraction of light from a cataractous lens that suggests that that may be causing vision problems. So what do people see when they have cataracts? Basically, the world looks blurry and no pair of glasses can make it look sharp again. Cataracts are, are beautiful to look at from the ophthalmologic standpoint. There's all different flavors of them. Uh, uh, I think many of my colleagues shared uh, uh, at least part of the reason of, of going to the field that, that I had, which is the uh, aesthetic wonder of looking at the eye through microscopes and actually seeing into the body when you do an exam. Uh, there's just something very transformative about that, that first time you sit down in front of one of these slit lamps and look at pathology directly in the eye. This is an example of a fairly severe cataract here that you wouldn't see very often in this country anymore, but is still very common in parts of the world like Sub-Saharan Africa. This is a mature cataract where the cataract has gotten so dense that it, actually the tissue around it has liquefied and it's almost like a little rock floating in the middle of the lens. 
Um, this is a cataract that is associated, these two, with metabolic conditions. You can have cataracts if your copper levels are too high or you are on prednisone or other steroid medications, those can cause cataracts to form. So there's all, all different flavors, but they're all treated about the same way. Now, a couple of years ago, I was uh, in Paris at a meeting, and I had the op opportunity in the afternoon to go to the Musée d'Orsay, and they had a, a very nice uh, photography exhibit from the 1850s, uh, uh, the early daguerreotypes. And I saw this uh, uh, beautiful picture there, uh, uh, anonymous uh, photographer, two sisters from 1850. And a close inspection of the, one of the sisters revealed this, which you can see uh, quite clearly here. There's the cataract that this young woman had in her right eye. Now, in 1850, this was basically a sentence to blindness in that eye. That eye was never going to see for this young woman. Uh, there was surgery available for this. Almost no one would put themselves through it because this is pre-anesthetic, and the surgery was to take a wire, to heat it very hot in a fire, to poke it through the eye and try to poke the lens into the back of the eye, called couching. And you can understand why most people would say, you know what, I have one good eye, I'm going to leave the other one alone. Don't, don't, don't bother me with that. But we've come so far, and I want to, to impress on you, this is really one of the, I think, the uh, great examples of, of uh, triumphs of modern medicine, is that you probably will never see a young person like this in this country uh, with this sort of a disease. It just, I haven't seen one in years. Uh, it's almost unheard of for anyone to walk around unable to see in one or both eyes, in this country at least, from a cataract. So when do we do surgery? The answer is cataracts bother us when they bother the patient, not before. So if the patient cannot see well enough to do their activities of daily living, uh, that is the major reason to do cataract surgery. Occasionally you will run across people who say, ooh, maybe you should get your cataracts out while you're healthy or, you know, they're just ripe. That, that almost never is the case. If the cataract's not bothering the patient, it can stay in place. It's not a cancer. It's not going to hurt the patient. But as soon as it does begin to bother the patient, that's when that dialogue should begin. Rarely, there may be something going on in the back of the eye that we can't see in because of the cataract, and that's a reason to do surgery also. And very rarely, the cataract may be causing other problems in the eye, like glaucoma uh, or inflammation, and if that's the case, then we also have to do surgery on a more urgent basis. Now, to take you through the basics of surgery before I show you a video of how this, this works, um, the basic idea is that you go into the eye, and it is a surgery. You need to make an incision to get into the eye. There's no laser that can take out a cataract, at least not in, in 2009. Um, you then have to open up the little uh, capsule that protects the lens and holds the lens, and then remove the lens in some way. And the way this is done uh, in modern cataract surgery is with a machine that actually has ultrasound waves to liquefy the lens. The lens is like a, a rock in a, a, a mature cataract. It, it is very, very hard. You need to liquefy it or break it up in some way to get it out of the eye. And then we replace the uh, lens with an acrylic or a silicone lens that's really custom uh, uh, fit for the individual and decreases their need for glasses after surgery. So let's watch the movie here. We'll look up on the screen. So this is courtesy of Dr. Shen, who will be speaking next, and this is one of her surgeries. And Tony, you can stop me if I, if I misspeak here. That first little incision is just a little stab incision to get into the eye and inject a little bit of a, what we call viscoelastic, which is basically a very viscous, uh, thick fluid that keeps the pressure in the eye as the larger knife goes in. Now, that larger knife is only about two and a half millimeters. It, it's really not a large knife. Uh, uh, I'll have you look at your neighbor's eyes after this is done to remind yourselves of what a small area this is to operate in. We then put in a uh, little bit more of this fluid, and the next step is to open that capsule up and get access into the eye. So the capsule is only about two or three cell layers thick, and this is really the most delicate part of the surgery. You have to grab the edge of it, and then with this little bent needle, or you can use a little forceps, you bring it around in a perfect circle and just tear it. We teach the residents how to do this practicing on saran wrap. It's about <coughs> as thick as saran wrap. Uh, and about as, as difficult to get a perfect tear around. And, and really, that's the, the most tricky part of the surgery. The next step is to go and hydrate the lens. And this involves injecting some salt solution into the lens itself to free it up from its attachments to this capsule. And you can see Dr. Shen doing this here. And what you really want to do is get that lens so well hydrated that you can actually spin it around inside the bag. Now, you'll notice that initially the lens uh, looked a little bit cloudy, but not very cloudy. But as that fluid goes in, it becomes very cloudy. And essentially, in the course of doing the surgery, we create 
a really dense cataract, which is what ends up being uh, removed. So she's going to now here try to spin the lens around a little bit. You can see her moving uh, uh, through this small incision. I should mention that in most of this surgery, the patient is awake, maybe mildly sedated, and most surgeons now use just a topical uh, anesthetic uh, during surgery. So the patient can actually kind of see what's going on here. <laughs> it's not that bad. Now, the magical piece uh, has just entered the eye, and that is the phaco emulsification tip. And this is the device that actually does the breaking up of the lens. This applies the ultrasound, and it has uh, uh, simultaneously a, a, an infusion port that lets fluid into the eye at exactly the same rate that a suction uh, port is taking it out of the eye. So the idea is you liquefy the lens, you suck out the lens material, and you replace it with clear fluid. And there's all sorts of techniques for doing this, and Dr. Shen is doing sort of a modified chopping technique here. This was not a very hard cataract, and so it, it came out in fairly large pieces. And you can see each piece is sort of brought in with the left hand, with that little uh, chopper or sweeper, into the port there of the, uh, of the phaco emulsification tip, and then it gets sucked out. And you'll start to see now a red reflex develop there at the back of the, of the eye, and that's the retina's reflex that we can see again uh, once the cataract has been removed. Okay, so there goes a, a good sized piece. This is also a fairly tricky part of the surgery, and um, just as that front part of the eye has a small capsule, the back part has the same small capsule, and the key is not to go through the back part. Uh, once you go through the back part, then the jelly in the eye can come forward, and that can cause complications. So all of this is really done within about a two millimeter space in the middle of the eye. This is true microsurgery. We do sit down for this. Uh, we're, we're not like the uh, cardiovascular surgeons throwing bloody rags all over the, the operating room. <laughs> Um, this is a very refined surgery, and it's usually very <laughs> quiet. Uh, we used to share a scrub tech at, uh, uh, in St. Louis with the orthopedic surgeons at the Veterans Hospital, and he'd always say uh, that uh, orthopedic surgery was power tools and ophthalmology was finesse, and I, I like that. That's, that's <laughs> very true. So what Dr. Shen is doing now is using a very small tip to remove the last little bits of the lens. The lens has a nucleus and a cortex. And the cortex is very soft and, and is easily removed just with the soft tip cannula, which is what she's doing here. You want to get all of the material out and leave the, the eye totally uh, clear of the lens material, which you can see that nice red reflex now uh, in, at, the, uh, at the end of this, this step. So the last step is to inject a lens into the eye. And this lens is a, a folded acrylic lens, and it goes through that same little two and a half or three millimeter incision. And it's rolled up just like a butterfly in a cocoon. So it's going to come out here from that injection. And you'll see it go into the center of the eye and then just sort of unfold. And this technique's been around for about 10 years now. It allows the surgery to be done through a very, very small incision. And there goes the lens. I think you can see it exiting. Again, this lens would have been calculated to the exact power for the length of the eye and the curvature of the cornea. And so it will be an exact substitute for the natural lens of the eye. Some of the newer models are able to focus it near and far a little bit, and, and uh, uh, some others have tints in them and things like that. There, there are a number of different lenses in use now. The original uh, discovery that you could use lenses in cataract surgery actually was a byproduct of World War II. Uh, Sir Harold Ridley uh, noted that when pilots were shot down and got plexiglass into their eyes uh, from the canopies of their, their jet fighters, they never had an immune response to it. And that was the little light bulb that went off that said, hey, we could probably put plastic in the eye and it would be tolerated well. And that's really what led to the modern intraocular lens. So here you can see that lens is now totally unfolded and nicely centered. It's inside that bag that Dr. Shen cleared out. Get rid of a little bit of that viscoelastic and that surgery is done. Normally you do a little bit of hydration of the wound. There's no stitch anymore. There's no patch uh, with most, most uh, uh, cataract surgery. And that whole surgery took, I think, five minutes and 38 seconds uh, from start to finish. And that can take a patient from complete blindness and unable to see a hand moving to 20-20 vision if the cataract is dense enough. It really is one of the miracles, I think, of, of modern uh, surgery and medicine. Now, let's move on to some other diseases where perhaps the treatments are not uh, as, as well understood and, and we're still in evolution stage. So macular degeneration is the leading cause of blindness in this country. There are, as I said, signs of disease in up to 30% of patients who are over age 80. Now, the symptoms of macular degeneration are uh, insidious. They come on slowly, and, and people often are not aware of them until they've been going on for a little while. Blurred central vision is certainly one of these symptoms, but so is distortion. 
straight lines looking wavy. And we've handed out to everyone here tonight an Amsler grid, which is that little checkerboard uh, that is a home test for macular degeneration. If the lines on that grid start to look like this, where they have the, uh, that waviness to them, our phone number's at the bottom, give us a call. <laughs> And as I showed you before, macular degeneration is common and it gets more common the older you get. Uh, it's very rare in people in their 50s and it's quite common in people in their 80s. And it doesn't know any distinction between gender and, and race. It affects everyone relatively equally. What it does to vision is it often in the wet form, the advanced form, blocks out the center of vision. People's peripheral vision remains fine but that center vision disappears. And you can imagine how frustrating that is when you look straight on at something and you can't see what's straight ahead of you. You can hold your thumb up and that gives you a pretty good idea of what it's like to have macular degeneration. Macular degeneration comes in two flavors, a dry flavor or non-exudative and a wet flavor. The dry flavor, I tell my patients, has good news and bad news. The good news is uh, that it's usually very slow. It usually doesn't blind people. It can blur the vision somewhat. Um, the bad news is we don't have much treatment for it. And we know that someone has dry form when we see this in their eye, which is this uh, yellowish pigment uh, called drusen uh, or, or, uh, or lipofusin, which accumulates in the back of the eye of people with the dry macular degeneration. You can contrast that to the wet form or the exudative form. This form occurs when blood vessels break beneath the retina. That dry form pokes little holes in a membrane that separates the blood supply of the outer retina from the retina itself. That membrane is a lot like the Tyvek they put on houses when they're building them. Uh, it's a, it allows uh, moisture to go through or nutrients, but it's not supposed to let big things through. And the eye's Tyvek, which is called Brooks membrane, does the same thing. Macular degeneration causes holes in that membrane and blood vessels will grow through and bleed and that's what causes the blindness in the wet form of macular degeneration. Now, if you go to see the ophthalmologist and they suspect that you have macular degeneration, one of the tests they're likely to do is called a fluorescein angiogram. And this involves starting a little IV in the hand or the arm and injecting a small amount of a very small molecule called fluorescein, an orange dye, into the vein, and then taking pictures of the eye as the dye goes through. What it will show us is where any new blood vessels in the eye exist. Even if they're in places where we can't see them directly, they will light up when the dye is in them. And these new blood vessels have the property that they leak. And so if we look and see new blood vessels that are leaking, we can say, yes, you have wet form macular degeneration. And there, as we'll talk about in a minute, there are treatments for that. Now the dry form currently does not have any good treatments. The only intervention that has been shown to be beneficial is a very particular set of vitamins, A, C, E, zinc, and copper in very specific doses that goes under the uh, name AREDS for the age-related eye disease study uh, trial. This was a large trial funded by the National Eye Institute that showed that if individuals took this vitamin, this collection of vitamins, which were available from several vendors commercially, uh, their risk of losing vision from the wet form of macular degeneration decreased significantly. It decreased from about 35% at five years if you had moderate dry form to begin with to about 28% at five years. Now, if you're an optimist, you say, well, 7% over 35, you know, roughly 20% risk reduction for taking vitamins, that's great. And if you're a pessimist, you scratch your head and you say, well, 28 people lost their vision anyway, and 65, nothing happened to them. So really only one person in uh, uh, about 14 had any benefit from taking the medicine. Um, and so is, is it worth taking the vitamins or not? I will tell you, I do recommend this to my patients because I can't tell you who that one person's going to be who's going to show benefit uh, for this. But it's not a panacea. Taking the vitamins will not prevent you uh, necessarily from getting the wet form of macular degeneration. Now, the wet form has changed dramatically in the last several years with the introduction of several FDA-approved treatments. The good news is these treatments are very effective, and for the first time, I can look my patients in the eye when they come in to see me and say, I think we can get you seeing better within a few weeks with this condition on average. Prior to two years ago, there was no treatment that I could say that to uh, for my patients. I could say we might be able to slow this down a little bit, but you're going to lose your vision. The bad news is that this treatment is given uh, by intraocular injection. So it's not the most pleasant of uh, treatments. In the office, we actually take a small gauge needle 
and use the, uh, one of two drugs, either uh, a Lucentis or a Vastin. Those are the trade names because the uh, generic names are almost unpro uh, unpronounceable. Um, to inject this drug directly into the back of the eye. The data are really remarkable. If you look out for two years after uh, treatment um, with these, uh, both of, uh, well, this is with Lucentis, which is the FDA approved form of the drug, you can see that the average patient two years out was reading six, line, six letters better on the eye chart than the day they walked in. Whereas the patients who were treated without the drug and were treated equivalently with sham injections lost on average about 15 letters. So that's almost four lines of vision improvement for using this drug, and that really has revolutionized our treatment of macular degeneration. Now that does not mean that people get back to 2020 with treatment, unfortunately. Many of these patients still wind up with vision of 2060 or 2080, which is borderline for driving and reading. Uh, however, it's a lot better than 2200, which is really legal blindness. So most patients now uh, who come in with wet form macular degeneration are, are offered one of these drugs. And if people are interested in the question session, there's, there's a very interesting backstory on the two drugs and, and uh, uh, why we have two agents and not, not just one. Let's move on to glaucoma now, the third of our blinding diseases. Glaucoma is the leading cause of blindness in the African American population in this country and a major cause of blindness in all populations. It has risk factors. Family history is a major one. There are genetic factors which predispose to uh, glaucoma just as there are for macular degeneration. High blood pressure, diabetes, African American ancestry. Again, glaucoma comes in several flavors. Uh, there is the open angle form, which is by far the most common form. There's a rare angle closure form, which is very acute and painful. And then there's congenital form, which we see sometimes in newborns or small children. Glaucoma is a disease of the optic nerve. Uh, and we, people associate it with high eye pressure, but really the disease itself is in the nerve. And there is a triad that we need to see to diagnose run-of-the-mill glaucoma, and that's high eye pressure, which causes injury to the optic nerve, which we see as the optic cup, which is this part of the nerve. This is a picture of the optic nerve that we see when we look in the eye. And this is the cup, which you can see enlarging here in this patient. And that, in turn, causes loss of visual field. So glaucoma really comes in from the outside of the vision to attack the center, unlike macular degeneration, which almost always starts in the center and moves out. The visual field defects can be quite severe. These are two examples of uh, patients I have with glaucoma who have lost half their visual field. That is, this patient cannot see the upper half of the world. This is what their visual field looks like. And you can imagine how debilitating that can be. This patient has lost everything but a little island that extends off uh, uh, towards, towards his nose. Now the problem with glaucoma is that it is a silent disease until the late stage. If you are in the early stages of glaucoma, you have no way of knowing it if you're not receiving eye care. So we have to examine the eye in order to determine who's at risk for glaucoma. The angle closure form, which accounts for less than 1% of glaucoma, is an exception. That creates a red, very painful eye, uh, but it's quite rare. So when you come into the office, what we will do is measure your eye pressure. And there are several devices for doing this. Ophthalmologists greatly favor the contact methods, which is either this little applination uh, device, which has the blue light that you've probably seen at your ophthalmologist, or the little pen that, that we actually touch the cornea. The methods that use air puffs and things like that really are not uh, uh, as accurate. So the screening recommendations for glaucoma is that if you're 40 or over and you haven't seen uh, an ophthalmologist or an optometrist for a dilated eye exam, you're overdue. Uh, everyone at age 40 or over should have a baseline exam to ensure that they're not at risk for the disease. Um, and then every two years is the current recommendation for a dilated eye exam, a complete eye exam. If your family history suggests glaucoma or you have other risk factors, an annual exam is recommended. Treatment of glaucoma is broken into medical and surgical. There are a host of eye drops that can lower the eye pressure. Again, the disease is not high eye pressure by itself. In fact, most patients who have high eye pressure don't have glaucoma. It's just the risk factor for it. Um, but the eye drops can lower the pressure, which is the only modifiable risk factor. And there's a whole variety that, uh, that are used, and each one is tailored for the patient's uh, other medical problems and, and potential uh, side effects of the medicines. And then there's surgical treatment. Surgery for glaucoma is a real art. Uh, it is a, a very sophisticated, very primitive surgery. Uh, basically, all glaucoma surgery involves making a hole in the eye somewhere to let the pressure out. 
But the way you do that can be quite sophisticated, involving making partial thickness flaps and releasable sutures and trying uh, to really tailor the surgery so that you let just the right amount of pressure out without letting all of the pressure of the eye out. The most common surgery that's done is the trabeculectomy. In this surgery, basically a hole is made at the top of the eye that allows fluid to uh, egress from the eye underneath the conjunctiva, which is the skin-like uh, covering of, of the external eye. And that creates this little bubble, which we call a bleb. And if you ever see anyone who has that on their eye, it means they probably had glaucoma surgery. Sometimes that surgery is not successful, and then we can use more advanced surgical uh, devices like this uh, Barevelt drainage valve. This is a valve that actually goes into the eye and like a soda straw, actually shunts fluid out of the eye to behind the eye, similar to the way you'd get a shunt in neurosurgery if you had too much pressure on the brain. Now finally, diabetic retinopathy. Diabetic retinopathy is the leading cause of blindness in uh, younger Americans aged 25 to 64. And it's also a major cause of blindness in, in folks over 64. If you have diabetes long enough, the odds are you're going to develop some diabetic retinopathy. If you look at the juvenile onset type 1 diabetics, about 50% of them will have diabetic retinopathy seven years after they're diagnosed. And by 20 years of disease, about 90% have signs of diabetic retinopathy. So the recommended screening for diabetic retinopathy is that if you do have the juvenile onset, uh, you, be di you have a screening exam within your first year. If you are adult onset diabetic, you should have that screening exam as soon as possible after diagnosis. Many people diagnosed with adult onset diabetes did not know they had it, and uh, it's unclear how long they may have had the disease. So to uh, uh, support this, there are currently 17 million Americans with uh, diabetes diagnosed, and it's estimated that there are about 6 million people walking around today with undiagnosed uh, diabetes. About 1 million new diagnoses get made each year. So this is an epidemic disease, and uh, as I'm sure you're all aware, it, the incidence and prevalence of diabetes are only rising, and the causes for that are, are multiple and not completely known. The risk factors for diabetic retinopathy are similarly unknown. The length of the disease certainly matters. The blood sugar control matters, but it's not everything. So I've seen patients with terrible blood sugar control who come in with five years of disease, bad sugars, and not a speck of blood in the back of the eye. And I have other patients who are as tight as they can be on their control and come in and have florid diabetic retinopathy. So we think there's some genetic factor, but that has not yet been identified. The symptoms in diabetic retinopathy, generally blurred vision, floaters from blood in the eye, a sudden loss of vision or parts of the vision. And in severe cases, you can get a very advanced form of glaucoma called rubiosis that can be painful. So again, in the artist's rendition of, of what you see with diabetic retinopathy, you can lose multiple parts of the vision with this disease. The pathogenesis is leakiness, in general, of the very small blood vessels in the retina. The retina has an extremely fine capillary network that supplies its, its blood. Uh, the retina is the, metabolically the most active tissue in the body. It has a huge need for oxygen, and so it has a very well-developed uh, vascular system. In diabetes, over time, that vascular system breaks down and begins to leak fluid and leak protein, uh, and then will begin to bleed. And you first get these little aneurysms, microaneurysms, and later that causes ischemia, loss of oxygen, which causes new blood vessels to be formed, and those will bleed and lead to uh, blindness. So if this is a normal retina, and we're looking at the optic nerve here, and the veins, and the arteries, and this is the center of the vision called the fovea, this is what an eye looks like with diabetic retinopathy. And you can immediately see how abnormal this is. There are multiple small hemorrhages throughout the retina. There are these large yellow areas. These are not the drusen of macular degeneration. These are exudates, which are proteins and fats that are coming through the vasculature and accumulating in the retina and disturbing its function. In the, so there are also two flavors of diabetic retinopathy. This is the non-proliferative form or background form of, of diabetic retinopathy. And generally, this is not the blinding form, although you can get enough leakage into the center of the retina that it's like looking through waterlogged film, or macular edema is what we would call that. There's also a proliferative form where new blood vessels uh, arise, and those blood vessels will go into the jelly of the eye, and when those bleed, you get a sudden drop of vision. In two, three minutes sometimes, the eye can fill up with blood and the vision can just go. So when patients have diabetes and give us a call in the office and, and say, I've suddenly lost vision in one eye, this is usually the first thing that we think about. 
Now, the treatment for uh, diabetic retinopathy uh, is functional. It works well, but it is kind of draconian, as I'll show you in a minute. The basic treatment for this disease is to do laser therapy. And this was one of the first medical uses of lasers. We typically use an argon laser, sometimes a krypton laser, green or red. And we use that angiogram, that same tool that we used uh, for macular degeneration, to find where the leaking blood vessels are. And then we spot weld them with the laser. And we'll actually just put a little spot of laser over each leaking blood vessel and try to close it off. The studies show that it is very effective. If you do this with most patients, two-thirds will preserve their visual acuity out to uh, five years, compared to only one-third untreated. So unlike the vitamins for dry macular degeneration, this treatment really benefits quite a lot of patients. Now, the proliferative form is also treated with a laser, but here it's almost like a case of frostbite where you cut off three fingers to save the other two. What we do in patients with proliferative disease is we burn the entire outer retina, and we apply maybe 1,000, 1,500, 2,000 laser burns to the outer part of the retina to get rid of all of the tissue that we think is sending out this SOS signal saying we need more blood vessels. And this is a, also a very effective treatment. In fact, uh, over 90% of uh, patients will uh, benefit from this laser treatment and have a reduction in their loss of vision from their proliferative disease with the laser therapy. So here's an example of a patient uh, uh, who's just undergone their second round of laser therapy. This, again, is the optic nerve. This is the center of the vision. We always stay far away from the center of the vision. But these are all the laser burns. And you can see several hundred here. This is a new session. And this is the session from two weeks earlier, uh, which have already begun to scar in. The cost of this treatment to the patient is they will lose their night vision. And so you get a reduction of, in peripheral vision and particularly night vision because you use your peripheral vision more at night, uh, does suffer uh, with this treatment. So I'm hopeful that 50 years from now, we look back on this like how we considered that couching surgery uh, uh, in 1850 in France and say, I can't believe that anyone would burn half the retina off to save the middle half. Didn't they know how to treat this? But right now, this is the best that we have. So what I've told you about are really the four leading causes of uh, vision loss in, in this country, cataract, diabetic retinopathy, macular degeneration, and glaucoma. And I've told you a little bit about the workup for these uh, diseases, the medical and surgical treatments that exist for them. I'd like to just spend a couple of minutes to tell you a little bit about what we're doing at University of Washington to try to further the art. We're very fortunate and excited to be opening a new eye institute at the Harborview campus, which will uh, open in July of 2009 of this coming year. And this is a partnership between University of Washington Medical Center, Harborview, and the whole UW Medicine enterprise. If you go around the country, you will find that many of the uh, discoveries that have led to these excellent outcomes in many eye disease have emanated from uh, eye institutes, and there are some wonderful ones around the country, several of which I, I show on this slide, Jewel Stein at UCLA and the Cole Eye Institute uh, at uh, Cleveland Clinic. An eye institute is really a place where you can centralize and concentrate as much of the eye care, the teaching, and the research in one facility uh, as, as possible. You try to integrate the research endeavor with the clinical endeavor so you get that all-important crosstalk between the scientists and the clinicians. Our eye institute will be in the new 9th and Jefferson building, uh, which is uh, uh, in its completion stages now on the Harborview campus. will be that entire seventh floor uh, and part of the eighth floor. There are eight beautiful new operating rooms in the basement of the mailing building. We are already occupying one of them, and we'll move into a second one next month for uh, eye cases. The goals uh, that we have are the same as the other eye institutes around the country, world-class patient care creating the finest uh, training environment in the U.S. for our students and our residents, serving our community, uh, and fostering the, uh, the best in vision research uh, in the United States. And I want to leave you with just a taste of some of that vision research and some of the research that we're doing at University of Washington to try to further the art and to try to make it so that fewer people lose their vision 10 years from now than, than do today. One of the most exciting things happening at this university is the work of Tom Ray and colleagues in retinal stem cells. Uh, UW is one of the nation's leaders in the uh, creation and understanding of the biology of retinal progenitor cells. In Dr. Ray's laboratory, he's able to take fibroblasts out of the skin and treating them with particular growth factors can differentiate them into cells that become retinal neurons. 
and when injected into an animal retina, take up residence, as these little red cells do here in this sea of green, um, will take up residence in the retina and appear to begin to function as normal cells within that retina. This is the cornerstone of regenerative medicine, and I'm very uh, proud and glad that uh, uh, what, uh, the University of Washington is at the forefront of this technology. Some of the work in my own laboratory uh, includes understanding how the eyes communicate light information to the brain even when vision isn't working. And it turns out there's a set of photoreceptors that have only been really appreciated for about the last five years or so that are located not in the rod and cone layer of the retina, but in the ganglion cell layer. And there are very few of them, only a few hundred in each of our retinas, but these appear to be the cells that tell us how bright it is. That is, that this auditorium is about 100 lux, and if you go outside, it's about 10,000 lux. And we think that this, these are the photoreceptors that tell our bodies how to shift rhythms with jet lag and probably have something to do with seasonal affective disorder and why so many people in this part of the world get the winter blues. And finally, uh, we're looking forward to integrating with the very strong global health community at University of Washington and in Seattle in general, really pioneering work to try to develop artificial corneas to treat uh, blindness throughout the world. So I hope that gives you some flavor for some of the research going on. I don't have time to even scratch the surface of, of the many excellent research projects going on at this university. Uh, and I hope this also gives you a little appreciation for what we do as ophthalmologists and a little bit of the medicine of the eye. So I, I thank you, and I'd be happy to take some questions. I have a question. Um, my father's family, my dad's family, um, he's, uh, there's only six of them surviving. Every single one of them, by the time they were 70, had a myocular degenerative disease where they were totally blind except for very slight peripheral vision. Is that unusual to find an entire family? I mean, my dad's the youngest, and he was diagnosed about five years ago, and he's lost uh, at least a third of his vision already. Yeah, that is an unusual condition. It sounds like a hereditary late onset retinal degeneration. And that's a part of a family of diseases called retinitis pigmentosa and related uh, uh, conditions. Those are genetic diseases. Uh, the fact it, it's all men who have it? No. Okay, so it's men and women both? Uh, and they're all of the same generation? Uh, yeah, my oldest aunt was, she died at 99 and my dad's early, mid 80s. Most of the, uh, those conditions can be genetically dominant, they can be recessive, they can be X-linked, but if, if women are involved, it's probably not X-linked if, if women have the disease. Yeah, he's got five sisters. <clears throat> um, it sounds like a, a dominant form of uh, late onset hereditary retinal degeneration. There's an enormous amount of research going into that class of diseases. Many of the mutations that cause those have now been identified, and there are centers throughout the country that do DNA sequencing to help people figure out if their kids are at risk, there's also a great deal of research going on to restorative medicine to try to figure out how to restore function to people who have lost that peripheral vision. And that includes things like the stem cell work that I described, as well as uh, actual microchips that people are trying to implant into retinas to restore function, and chemical means of trying to, uh, and gene therapeutic means of trying to restore the genes that are, are mutated uh, in order to, to slow the progression or reverse it. Uh, but yeah, that's an unusual condition. Three questions I hope you can address. First, uh, do you know of diet or exercise regimes that would help glaucoma? Diet or exercise machines for glaucoma? Um, are, are there any? I am not aware of any dietary supplements that have actually been shown to be beneficial for glaucoma. I also don't know to what extent that's been examined to the uh, uh, degree it has for macular degeneration or for, um, uh, or for uh, cataract. In terms of exercise, there is a small literature suggesting that exercise can lower intraocular pressure, but that's not a very strong literature, and right now there's no formal recommendations on exercise paradigms as there are for heart disease or blood pressure. Okay. Second question, uh, is there a promise of reversal of the vision loss from glaucoma? Yeah, so currently in 2009, there is no way to reverse the vision loss. Once the ganglion cells have died, the uh, ganglion cells are what are known as post-mitotic uh, cells. They don't divide and replace themselves. So that's a, a large impetus for these uh, stem cell therapies, is to try to create a way to restore those, those cells. There's no way to do that right now. Uh, occasionally, when people's glaucoma gets under control, they do get a slight improvement in the visual field. 
But if there are very large visual field losses, those are usually permanent. Third question, well, what is the treatment for, the, for a sudden attack of narrow angle, narrow angle glaucoma? So the question is, what is the treatment for a sudden attack of narrow angle glaucoma? Um, the immediate treatment is uh, you need to get yourself to a, an emergency room, uh, preferably one with an ophthalmologist on call. Uh, drops are generally given to, to reduce the pressure. The way you know you have this is you get a sudden onset of an extraordinarily painful red eye, usually halos around lights. People are usually sick to their stomach because the pressure can be 70 or, or even 80 millimeters of mercury in the eye where normal is, is about 20 or less. Um, after the drops have been administered, the immediate treatment is to create a little short circuit to allow fluid to flow within the eye again. And that's done with a laser. So a laser peripheral iridotomy uh, is done emergently in those cases. And almost always that's curative. Uh, if your ophthalmologist thinks you're at risk for this, you can do that peripheral iridotomy prophylactically to prevent you from ever having an angle closure attack. And that's usually a good idea because it's a very benign procedure. And if you're anatomically narrow, if you have anatomically narrow angles, it's worth doing that. Thank you. Um, you mentioned two drugs uh, that help with wet macular degeneration. C can you explain what they do? Yes. So the two drugs, Avastin and Lucentis, uh, are monoclonal antibodies directed against vascular endothelial growth factor. VEGF, it, it, for short, is a uh, very potent chemical that the body makes when it wants new blood vessels to grow somewhere. Tumors use this. Uh, it's used in development to vascularize organs. Uh, it, it turns out to be necessary for the maintenance of these blood vessels. And so this monoclonal antibody is a, a genetically engineered molecule, actually goes into the eye, binds the VEGF, and takes it out of the eye, which then uh, makes the blood vessels die away. They cannot survive without it. Um, and the two drugs are extremely similar. They have very slight differences in their chemical composition. Uh, but it was a historical artifact that the same drug got developed twice by the same company. I have an open angle glaucoma question. Uh, the Europeans, the Germans in particular, uh, do proactive trabeculectomies while in the U.S. Uh, we tend to use medical uh, therapies first. Um, where is the research going on? Who's right at this point? Yeah, that's an excellent question. So the question is, what's the best way to treat glaucoma? Is it better to do surgery first, or is it better to treat with medicines first? And you are correct. In Europe, there is a more of a tendency to take a surgical approach initially. In this country, it's uh, more medical. There have been studies comparing outcomes directly of the two, and the results basically say both do very well. The risk with surgery is that trabeculectomy uh, carries a, a, a significant risk, uh, several percent per year of a serious eye infection for life once you've had the surgery done. And so I think in this country, uh, and the reasons for this are open to speculation and to what extent medical legal aspects uh, uh, play into this, in this country, I think most ophthalmologists are a little reluctant to take on the risk, the long-term risk of infection, if there are means that are not going to uh, uh, carry that, that particular risk. So I think that's some of the reticence in going to surgery first. But I think you will find that, that uh, if glaucoma is advanced, in this country, most people will advance quite quickly to surgery uh, if the drops have not brought the pressure into an acceptable, acceptable range. Um, but it has been looked at in controlled trials, and the outcomes basically say both sides do very well, uh, equivalently well. Thank you. Sure. Hey, thank, thank you for your presentation. Just a quick question on macular degeneration. And can it be, hopefully, totally um, prevented by wearing sunglasses? Oh, boy, that's one of my favorite questions. The, uh, the jury is completely out on that question. The question is whether sunglasses can prevent macular degeneration. There's a very compelling scientific uh, argument which says that blue light in particular uh, has an energy that can do something very unusual to the chemicals in the retina and can form that yellow substance in the drusen, uh, which, part of which is lipofusin, is formed from two retinal molecules reacting with a, a divalent amine. It's thought that that may contribute to macular degeneration. However, when this has been looked at in, in a number of studies, the results retrospectively 
are all over the place. Some suggest that uh, light exposure has no effect. Some uh, show that light exposure has significant effect in worsening macular degeneration. So I don't think we know the answer yet. There was a study just came out last month uh, from, again, the National Eye Institute out of the same AREDS trial where they looked at individuals who had their cataract, which is a natural sunglass. It absorbs blue light and it almost acts like sunglasses within the eye and had it replaced with one of these clear lenses. And that study showed fairly clearly there was no increased risk of macular degeneration in individuals who had their cataractus lens replaced with a clear lens. And I think those are the best data right now. I advise my family, my friends, everyone, wear sunglasses because there's no downside really to them and there is the possibility that blue light does have deleterious effects on the retina. But the hard data proving that aren't, aren't in yet. Great. Thank you very Thanks. much. Wonderful. That was perfect. Thank you.